Very good. Um, good evening to everybody. Welcome to the first class of what Bezrat Hashem will be. Many, many classes um, on the subject of tefillah, prayer. Um, just a few little technical notes. I keep people on, I, for those of you who've been in my classes over the years, you know this, but this is for anybody who's new. I keep everyone on mute. So this way, um, any background noise, anybody else talking, it, it, you don't have to worry about it. We won't hear you. If you do have something to say, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, pop in. You can always use the chat. I don't always see it right away. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, but if you want to say something, please feel free. Um, classes will be Bezrat Hashem Sunday evenings slash after morning if you're in the States. And <clears throat> we'll run about 40, 45 minutes. And I was asked just to, before some of you came on of like for how long you think this class will go. So the answer, Bezrat Hashem, is a few years. Um, so this is the beginning of a, a hopefully a nice long journey together, Bezrat Hashem. Um, I make use heavily of PowerPoint. Uh, I'll be sharing my screen most of the time with PowerPoint. And some of the texts or some of the things I'll make, uh, you'll see on the screens, maybe in Hebrew. And if you have trouble with Hebrew, don't worry. Everything gets translated. And again, if you have any questions, definitely feel free to interrupt. It's not an interruption. Just feel free to uh, pop in and say you need clarification. So let me start off by uh, calling up the PowerPoint. I played around with all kinds of um, designs on different slides. And hopefully it doesn't make you crazy. I just figured I want to try that out and see how that goes. Um, so again, welcome to the Tefillah class. B'Shem Hashem Na'aseh V'Natzliach, Adonai Sevatai Tiktach Ufi Agiti Latecha. We are starting off in a true journey together that is going to include much, much more than just talking about translating the words. If you want to just get a translation of the words, you could pick up many, many types of Sidurim and you just look at the English or look at the Spanish or look at the whatever the language, Swedish. And, uh, and and go for it. This is going to go way beyond just the translation. <clears throat> As we get towards the actual tefillah, which will take us at least a week or two before we actually start into any of the real tefillot. Um, as we get towards it, um, I'll put it on the screen. You'll have everything in front of you. It's good if you want. Uh, if you want to take notes or you want to have a sidur, you make, put some notations in. That's great. Uh, whatever works for you. And like I say here on the screen, we're going to take a look at some new aspects of tefillah. It will include uh, not just the explanation, the backgrounds, and everything else. We'll talk about halacha, how you deal with certain situations. Uh, you wake up late or you run late to davening, or what do you say, asher yatsar, if you're, all kinds of things that are going to come up. Literally hundreds of possibilities with that. Um, and again, if you're looking for something that's just going to be translation, then you know, you're welcome to stay in the class. But this is going to be much more than that, Bezrat Hashem. I want to read to you a, a Gemara and explain to you what it says here. And this is really the basis of why I'm doing this class. It says in the Gemara, Amar Rav Yehuda Bar Shela. Rav Yehuda said in the name, Rav Yehuda Bar Shela said, in the name of Rabbi Asi and Rabbi Yochan, Shishad Varim Adam Ochel Perotehem Ba'olam Hazed. There are six things. This is very similar, but not identical to the first Mishnah and Peah that some of you are familiar with. There are six things that a people, a person does in this world. His, he gets a reward in this world and the next. And these are the items for which a person gets rewarded, both in this world and the next. Bringing guests into your home. Visiting the sick. We'll come back to that one. Hashkamat be tamidrash, people coming early to davening. Vamgadel banav the Talmud Torah, vadanet chaverol lechav zefu. I'll leave those other two off for right now. I'm going to go back to iyun tefila. What does it mean, iyun tefila? So it 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 really means the studying of tefila. Does that mean tefila? Means doesn't mean davening. And all these terms I'm using, we're going to see tonight. We're going to get into what they actually mean and the, some of the sources potentially for these words. But just right now, I'm using the colloquial terms daven, tefillah, prayer, just interchangeably right now. Iyun tefillah, which is this in, in black over here, in bold, really means more than just tefillah. Because if it meant just tefillah, it's great to daven. But why does it say that someone would get a reward in this world or the next world for tefillah? 
So it really means when you investigate, when you spend time learning about what it is you say. Now, among the things we're going to talk about, um, and I want to show you, this is in no particular order, and we're not going to talk about all this tonight, maybe. You'll see some over the next week or two. Probably one of the first questions we will deal with uh, a little later on tonight is, why do we dive? Why pray? What's the, what's the question? We know that Hashem knows better than we do what it is we need, what it is we want. What do you think he doesn't know that I want X, Y, and Z? Of course Hashem knows. And not only that, Hashem knows what's best for me. So why don't I just sit there and say, okay, God, do your magic. Just do what you need to do. Some of it, by the way, you may come up with some answers, and there'll be others that maybe you'll not have thought of. Is it a Torah-based requirement to daven, or is it rabbinically mandated? It's a very big machloket or dispute. And the question is like, who cares? <laughs> Why should I care if it's what's called deoraita comes to the Torah, or the Rabbanan, or the rabbis instituted? And again, along the way, when we, we'll see the two opinions, and then we'll see later, not today, about why that will make a difference to us in certain things. Where did it come from? Who wrote what we say? Um, the Sidur has many versions. Ashkenazi, Svaradi, we'll, we'll talk about that. Why are there so many versions? And where we'll probably start a moment is certain terminology. Davin, Tfilah, we're going to talk about the word Amen at some point. We're going to talk about the structure of a bracha. Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech olam. <clears throat> it's a, a, a coined phrase that we use literally tens or hundreds of thousands of times in our lives. But we have to first stop and see what, did it, what does that bracha mean? What does it mean when we say Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech olam v'chulei, etc.? We'll come to that. So the first thing I want to do is because we're throwing on these terms, let's talk about the word David. Many people think it's Yiddish. Okay, so here's a list of some possibilities. And by the way, as we go through some of this, it's going to be kind of mechanical. I'm just going to read some of this, the slides, and some of we will be discussion. But right now, I just want to make sure we get some of these terms um, understood. The very first one, and probably one of the most common beliefs, is that the word Davin comes from the Aramaic, the language of the Gemara, of De'avuhon, which means of the fathers. That will become clearer why we're saying that, um, or why that might be a reason when we come to a, another topic in a little while. Uh, perhaps it comes from the word daf, which means page, and dafnin meaning turning pages, maybe. There's no, by the way, there is no clear cut answer. There's no for sure. Oh, this is for sure it. Um, the possibility that comes to the Arabic word to pray, which is dawa, maybe from there. There's a Lithuanian word, which actually is very interesting, davana, which means to, a gift. Now, why would that potentially be where it's from? Let's assume whatever country you're listening to this in, you had the opportunity, whenever you wanted to talk to the president or the prime minister or the king or whoever, it may, anytime, his door, is her, his door or her, if it's a queen, is a, a, or potential female prime minister, obviously, or president, Bezrat Hashem. Um, what what would it be to you that access, not just between three and four in the afternoon, but twenty four hours a day, seven days a week? You could walk into that that person's office. That's a huge gift to be able to have that access, be able to have that opportunity to connect with that that person. So potentially coming from Lithuanian Davana, meaning a gift, it could be that. Another possibility is Dalit Bet Bet. Davav, like Dovev Meisharim. Dovev means to move the lips. Um, there's a, a famous um, Gemara that talks about that, for example, when you quote someone who's no longer alive, you quote a Rava or a Baye or someone from the Gemara, that their lips move in the kever when you say their words. Uh, whether that's meant allegorically, literally, don't, don't, don't ask me. I'm not checking that out. But it's also a possibility. And finally, this is another one that seems to be fairly well common, is that it actually is a cognate of the word divine. Because what we do is we connect with the divine. So that's the, the word. Some say, again, I didn't even put on this list, say maybe it's Yiddish. But it, even the Yiddish had to come from somewhere. So that's maybe it. Okay, now, let me make this slide a little bigger. In Hebrew, the word is lehit palel. 
even if you know this word already, let's take a look at it for a minute. The word Lehit Palel has two possible meanings for us. First of all, on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see the, a little comment. Pei Lamed Lamed in Hebrew, the Shoresh, uh, has means a sense of a judge, like like um, uh, plilim. Modern day Hebrew, you have plili, which is um, which is when you do something criminal. The word lamed hey tough. In other words, you have two parts of the word. If you look up here, I'll spread it out. The pe lamed lamed is the shoresh of the word. It does not mean to pray, not even close, not even close. It means to judge. Lehit, like lehit rachetz. These are reflexive. That means you do to yourself. So what does it mean? It means that you judge yourself. How? What does it mean? I get up and I go to Davin, and what do you mean I'm judging myself? So while we will, when we get to Shmona Esrei, way down the road, we'll discuss this in great detail. Let me give you a little insight. When we pray to God, and we ask Hashem, Give me da'at, give me sense, give me knowledge. When we ask Hashem, give me abilities to do things. We also need to be asking ourselves, what is it we're doing with the, the, the things that Hashem has given us? Give me harnasa, give me money, give me health, give me clothing, give me food. But I have to judge myself in quotes right now and say, what am I doing with what Hashem has given me already? Am I using them the right way? So every time I'm asking Hashem for something, we're also, when we're through tzvilah, through prayer, we're also, the word lehit palel means reflexively, we in a sense reflect on what am I doing with what God gave to me now? And that's what this meaning is over here. There's a fascinating explanation, another one, which has a completely different approach. And the, is pei lamed lamed has another meaning. It's to expect, to think, to incorporate, so the word filauti, it says, I'm sorry, go to the left-hand side over here. And again, let me read it, translate it. By Yom Yisrael Yosef, what happens is that Yosef has now brought his two sons after Yaakov comes down to Mitzrayim and he meets Yosef and Yosef brings his two sons to him and, and, and Yaakov exclaims the following. By Yom Yisrael El Yosef, and Yaakov said to Yosef, Re'e fanecha lo filauti. I never expected, I never thought that I would see you again. Now Hashem has shown me even your descendants, your children. So here the word filalti has nothing to do with judgment. It has to do with expectation or to think. I never thought. Because what we are doing when we daven, what we're doing when we say tfila, is we're also thinking at that moment about a connection we're making with Hashem. There is an expectation that we have is expectation that Hashem has. But that, that that idea of expectation, which sounds somewhat negative almost, we're going to talk about much later down the road, but I want you just to see this idea of what it means of this, this particular word. Now, I want to actually, let me just see something. I'm going to self-edit for a minute. Let's skip this. Okay. I'm going to skip the, the, the other slide. I was going to go back. I'm going to go back to that because I want to really get into the general question first, which I think really serves as a very good introduction. Why pray? Why die? Picture the following. Now, some of you who have been in classes with me over the years, <clears throat> um, for those of you who don't know, I have taught and still teach multiple classes. Um, it, it, everything's available on YouTube, and i am be happy to explain to anybody who's interested in the future um, what it is, uh, what other classes we have. I'm going to just take it off of screen share for a moment. And we're going to talk about the idea of why we die. So I was starting to say that those of you who've been in class with me before, you may have heard this mashal, but I think it really fits over here as well, this, this parable. A child goes to a birthday party. And at the birthday party, they have cake. They have, sorry, from Chicago, they have pop. That's what you call soda. They have ice cream, they have candy, and then they come at the end and they get a goodie bag. And in the goodie bags, more candy and more treats. And they come home barely able to breathe. And they say to their mom or the dad, I want that candy now. And the mom or dad says, absolutely not. 
Why not? Because if you eat it, you're going to get sick. Now, does the kid who's five, six, seven years old really understand or is this, they want it? It's instant gratification. It's just more treats. It's more candy. It's more cake, whatever it is. Now, the child thinks that what's good for them right now is that treat. The parent knows it may be good for them, but not right now. Now is not the time. So is the parent mean when they don't give the child what they're asking for? Of course not. The parent knows better than the child. Now, when we expand that to Hashem and all the quintillions and septillions and gazillions of, of tefillot that come to Hashem every single day of whatever the topic might be, Hashem already knows what we want. He also knows what's best for us. So if I say, let's say I'm making up a, I'm making up a scenario because it's not true. Let's say someone offered me a job and um, it makes X amount of shekel a year. It's a great opportunity. Or um, I'm out of a job and I need parnasa. Or um, whatever, just fill in the blank. And I think that this is the best job I could ever get. I really want this. And I'm davening to Hashem for it. Hashem knows that this job is, is likely going to be the worst thing for me. I Because I don't see something. I'm missing something. I'm not seeing the big picture, maybe. Hashem does. So when an opportunity comes, why don't I just say, okay, send me a sign, God. Why should I even daven about it? What is the purpose of tefillah? If Hashem already knows it's best for me, Hashem knows what I want. So I have no idea. So have a nice day. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this. We're going to do is talk. I'm going to mention a couple ideas. Then we're going to look at some of the commentaries, what they say. A lot of a lot of the way I teach about tefillah and also in certain other classes like Mesilat and Sharim, I like to compare the relationship that we have with Hashem to husband and wife. And by the way, that's not out of the pale. I mean, when we say in, in the, the end of the Torah, Hashem is Sinai Bab, is Rach Miseir Lamo, and we, the, the, the Mepharshim explain that we're likened to Hashem, like coming to greet his bride. It's, so that's this, this, not out of the pale whatsoever. But it also has to explain to us what it means about a relationship. Many people never think of davening as building a relationship with Hashem. Let me take a step back before I continue, though. There's two ways to ask about what time shul starts. You can ask, what time is davening? Or you can ask, what time is it over? What's pshat? What is the difference? You want to know when it starts because hopefully you want to be there on time. You want to be able to start with the beginning of the tefillah, whether it's shacharit on Tuesday or it's ne'ila. When is it over? Sometimes just means I can't wait for this to be done. And I just need to know what time I need to get there to make sure I'm there at a reasonable time and I finish with everybody and then we got Kiddush or whatever it might be. And there's everything in between. I do not pass judgment on people. You do what you're going to do. You come to show when you're going to come to show. But what is happening, whether you're davening at home, you're davening in a forest, or you're davening a bit Knesset in a show, or in some shtibel or wherever it might be, you are actually building a relationship with Hashem. Probably one of the basic, simplest ways to start off is to say that the reason we daven is to make a relationship with Hashem. And what does that mean? Imagine the following scenario. Husband and wife. And they're, the husband walks in. They've been married for five years. The husband walks in. Morning, morning. How you doing? Fine. Have a nice day. Good. Bye. And they don't talk to each other all day. And near the end of the day, what's for supper? Let's eat. Okay. Let's watch something. Okay. Night. Love you. Bye. What kind of relationship is that? So when what is the relationship that could be during the day? This isn't the marriage, this is the marriage counseling course, but could be, you know, that you say something to your spouse during the day. If you're not together, send them a message, give a call. I was thinking about you. whatever it might be. It's it's part of a relationship. So when we're going to Shoulder, but let's just say generic, when we daven, when we say our tfilot, we're also every day building a relationship with Hashem. Hashem is available to us 24-7. I have asked many kids over the years. I teach a lot of teens and young kids. Um, I ask them a very simple question. What is it that we have to thank Hashem for? And I give them a hint that it's only one word answer, and there's no other answer in the world for it. And the answer is everything. Because there's absolutely nothing that we have or do or see or 
are able to participate in without Hashem's giving us that ability. Everything. The fact that I can move my fingers, blink, talk, teach, think, that's all because of Hashem. And Hashem does this, as we say in Birkat HaMazon, V'chein v'chesed uvrachamim. He does it with grace. He does it with chesed, with kindness. He does it with rachamim, with mercy. But why do we even say that? So those of you who just were finishing up Sefer Nechemiah with me recently, before Pesach, you remember that there was a pasuk there that said, that, that Nechemiah was saying that even when the Bnei Yisrael, quote unquote, spit in Hashem's face with, in, the, in various times in the Midbar, the next morning, there was still mud. The manna was still outside the tent. In spite of the fact that Bnei Yisrael rejected God, spit in his face, and Hashem still gave the chen, the chesed, so that when we do what we're supposed to, and we act like we're supposed to, and we dive in, this is just building more of the relationship and the connection between us and Hashem. But again, if Hashem knows what we want, the why, why should we do it? Just for a relationship? That, that's a one reason. That's a good enough reason. So what happens when we dive in? If every, let's ask even a better question. If everything, and because not everything, that's not true. If many things are decided up front, for example, we know from the Gemara and Rosh Hashanah that a person's mizonot, their, the money they're going to have, at the end of this year, at the end of Tafshin Pei Gimel, not talking 2023, but come Erev Rosh Hashanah, Tafshin Pei Dalit in September, the amount of money that I'm going to have in the bank is already determined for me on Rosh Hashanah, Tafshin Pei Gimel, back last September. So if that's the case, why don't I just stay home all day? I can still watch Netflix, I can teach, I can play on the phone. Why go to work? It's already set. So what happens when we properly pray? And let's look at him from before you even answer that. Let's go from a different perspective. Person davens for somebody who's sick. Well, if there's a gzera, if there is a decree that that person is to be sick for whatever reason God forbid, then what does our tefillah do? How does that change? What is it? Are we supposed to change God's mind? Oh, you know what? Because they said, look, I'll tell you what just happened with, with Lucy D., Hashemikum Daman for her children. For those of you who noticed the Tehillim, the public Tehillim that was being said, 97, 95,000 chapters of Tehillim were said. 95,000 that were recorded in a matter of just a few days. So, what was it that we were trying to change God's mind that she shouldn't die? So, what is this about? We're not trying to affect a change in Hashem. Hashem doesn't change. We're trying to affect a change in ourselves. Let's say that there's Mr. Cohn. And Mr. Cohn, for some reason, is supposed to get pneumonia, God forbid. That was in the God's chart. And every day, Mr. Cohn, who doesn't even necessarily know, but so he's not, he's starting to feel not so good. He starts davening for himself, or his friends start davening because they see he's not feeling good. They add them to the Tehillim list, or they add them to their Fuash Lema list, and they start davening. We're not trying to change Hashem's mind that he's not going to give the Gezeva. We're trying to change ourselves. Mr. Cohen is trying to change himself, because if he changes himself, he's no longer the one who's the recipient of that Gezeva. He's no longer the same person. If I throw a ball directly at you, and you don't move, I'm going to hit you. But if I throw a ball at you, and you move, the ball did not change the trajectory. You moved. So if there's a gzera against the person, and a person davens, <clears throat> that changes the person. And by doing so, the negative is going to get changed as well, because it's not going to, quote, hit you. What about the positive? Let's say I'm supposed to have 100 shekel in the bank at the end of the year. God forbid, only 100 shekel. <laughs> but I daven for parnasa, And I start davening, and I realize that, look, I know that I don't necessarily, I'm making this up, of course, I don't really 100% believe that Hashem is the only source of my parnasah. Maybe if I go to my boss and ask for more money. But then I start saying, you know what? He is. Hashem is, is the only source. And I change my attitude, my perspective. I'm no longer the same Zev Shandalov as I was on Rosh Hashanah. So therefore, the amount that was going to be in my 
bank account at the end of the year could change. It also has to do with hishtadlut, known in English as hishtadlut, doing my own, my part. Hashem is going to get involved. I need, I need to show involvement. I need to do something about it first. Now, that discussion of why uh, we daven, just a general discussion, could go on for a very long time. But I want to show you a couple of sources, and I'll translate them. <clears throat> Here's one. One of the things that's there to do is to wake us up from our slumber, our daily slumber that we go through day in and day out. I am sure that it happens to you because I know it happens to me. Some days you go like, wait a minute, what day is it? Or wait a minute, I'm in Shimon Esri. Did I say Slach Lanu? Where am I? Our minds wander. We are stuck. We are sometimes just going through the motions without really engaging our brain. For those of you who learned Tanya, by the way, with me, that's Tuesday night's topic. Um, <clears throat> so one is just to, to get the, the juices flowing and to wake us up. But we also have this idea. There's two more I'm going to share with you. Number one, <inaudible> that we should have the davening, the tefillah, accompany us, whoops, sorry, throughout the day. How? Baboker, In the morning you daven, I'm oh, sorry, I'm trying to just move this down here. In the morning you get up and you daven before your day starts and you're busy involved in, in, in work. Then, in the middle of your day, when you are busy, with your work and with your business, you take a stop and a pause from Mincha because you also want to engage Hashem and be involved. And then Balayla at night, at the end of the day, when you're free and you're not encumbered by business and hopefully you can clear your mind to daven. So this is just a oh, another general reason, but this is amazing what Rav Yudah Levi said. Rav Yudah Levi said in Kuzari. I'll read and translate. This needs an introduction. We as human beings are made up of two things. We are a goof, a physical body. And we are neshama, we're a soul. The soul is eternal, the goof is not. The body is not eternal. The soul is. It is a what's known as a chelak elokami ma'al, or part of Hashem, literally. Um... And we have to give to our body, what happens if we don't eat? Besides losing weight. But if we don't eat for a period of time, it could be dangerous. We don't drink for a period of time. It could be dangerous. So it says, Just like we require food that is the sustenance for our physical body, Tfilah is what sustains our neshama. What does that mean? When a child is born, and the neshama, there's a whole machlok at once the, the neshama enter the body. I'm not getting get into that. But when the neshama, the soul, enters the body, the soul doesn't want to be here. Imagine for a moment, let's talk in human terms. You're sitting on a beach. You have a nice, whatever, cold drink in your hand. It is the absolute perfect day of, 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 the, of weather. The, the water is gorgeous. You're surrounded by your family. You have everything. You have your svarim. You have your drink. You have your. You have everything you want. And someone says, "Oh, you know what? We need you to do something. What? We need you to go down and climb into the sewer and get something for us." How readily would you want to do that? The answer is, you would never want to do that. And yet, the neshama, which is sitting in the havdil, is sitting, as it were, in the olama neshamot, to the world of the souls of Hashem, comes down into this. Which how can you get any better than that? It has to come down into this material world. The neshama has no need for materialism, material things, none, nothing. And it comes down against its will, so to speak, into this world, into a person. What is it going to get in this world? You think if I eat an extra slice of pizza, it helps my neshama. You think if I spend an extra hour watching a movie, that's going to help my neshama. It's exactly the opposite. It doesn't do anything with neshama. So where does the neshama get its sustenance? When we do mitzvot. Again, a plug for Tanya. It's, it's, uh, it's all about. When we do our mitzvot, and when we daven, Rabbi Yudah Levi says that when we daven, 
That is the sustenance of the neshama. Why? It goes back to what we said before. This, the, this that when we build this relationship with Hashem, it's not just like, hey God, good morning, Bokato, bye, I'm out of here. But we actually start building this, this the relationship. The neshama itself in us starts to get more connected to Hashem. It says that matirina otanu beneria sholechet mitma etet kishimitra hakim yatfila. When we daven, the tfila gives us, it kind of loads us up, kind of like uh, going to the gas station and filling up. It fills us up as we go through our day when we get further and further away from the moment we're davening. Now, let's say you daven, I daven early, but let's just say, okay, I daven, I'm at six o'clock is, is Shachavit where I'm davening. By 6.45, I'm finished, Be'erich, and leave show and come home. From then until, say, 1.30, when I daven Mincha usually, I'm not davening. I'm hopefully learning. I'm teaching. I'm doing hopefully living a Torah life, but I'm not in the active mode of tefillah. But he's, Rabbi Yudha Levi tells us in the Kuzari that the, the, the more I daven, the better I daven, and the more attention I pay to my tefillah, it gives me this energy to continue until my next tefillah. Because tefillah is truly the meeting point with Hashem, much more so than many other points during the day. Now, having said that, we want to see um, what's the source of tefillah. Why do we daven is not the question, but we know we daven three times a day on a weekday. And the question I want to deal with is where did that come from? I'm not dealing tonight with there's a question is that how many tefillot a woman has to daven? There's a there's a difference between Sfaradim and Ashkenazim in the halacha. We'll deal with that at some point. Parenthetically, the order with which we will do tefillah when we get to it, Bezrat Hashem, will be based on an Ashkenazi sidur, um, because the vast majority of the people in the class will be davening to the Ashkenazi sidur. When there are differences between Ashkenazi and Sfaradi, I'll, I'll point them out. But why three times a day? Where'd that come from? Well, three is a nice number. Why is it a nice number? Because it is the, besides the fact, well, I shouldn't say besides, it's a number that establishes a pattern, right? So if I say to you, what's the next number in this pattern? Three, six, doesn't necessarily mean nine is going to be the next number. It could be two, it could be six, it could be 12, because I didn't tell, establish a pattern yet. A number three establishes a pattern. That's why we have in halacha the concept of a chazaka. A chazaka means that you've done something three times, and then once you've done it, you can only undo it by saying um, um, uh, you kind of like disavow the vow. So where does the number three come from here? So there's two possibilities, the Gemara tells us in Braho. Itmar, we learn in the Braita. Rabbi Yosef, Rabbi Hanina Amar, Rabbi Yosef, son of, of Rabbi Hanina, said, Tfilot avot tiknu. Now this is just a very tiny slip, snippet of the Gemara. The Gemara is very long in this section. I'm just giving you the, 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 the basic and I'm explain it. Rabbi, Hanina, uh, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Hanina said that tefillot were established by the avot, by the fathers, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. If you, if you remember, when we were looking at that list a few minutes ago of the maybe where the word daven comes from, I said the first one we're going to come back to, which is de'avuhom, which means of the fathers. So one of the opinions that the word daven comes from is this, that the fathers, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, were the ones who established tefillah. The Gemara goes on to explain, based on Psukim, Avraham established Shacharit, Yitzchak, Mincha, and Yaakov, Arvit. The other opinion the Gemara gives us is Rabbi Yoshua, Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi Amar, tefillot keneged tzimidim tiknu, that they are in replacement or in uh, idea of the korbanot that we brought. As you know, in the Beit HaMikdash, there were korbanot. And the korbanot were brought at, brought at specific times of the day. And the truth is, it says timidim, were really the tam, korban tamid was brought in the morning. And the korban ben arbaim was brought late in the afternoon. There were no korbanot at night. So the, what's Mariv for if there were no korbanot at night? So we will deal with that eventually. So we have two possibilities, that we have three tefillot a day because there were three times in which korbanot were brought. I mean, actually, I'm just playing my hand right now because it doesn't make sense if I don't. Mariv is in place of it. It says the evarim and pedarim, what didn't burn on the mizbeach properly 
during the eat during the late afternoon was then thrown onto the fire in order to be burned during the course of the night. So we have three stages. You have the morning korban, the afternoon korban, and the night the korban, the evarim and pedarim, the, the parts of the body that were not of the animal that were not completely consumed. So that's one opinion, which is the second one we that we do three times a day like that. The other opinion is that we had the Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, that they established Tefillah. Well, which is it? So the Gemara comes to a very nice conclusion. Ella, Tefillot Avot Tiknu. They say, here's, this, here's the, the resolution. In fact, the Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov did establish the Tefillot, but didn't it doesn't necessarily mean that they're specific when during the day they were to be said. So the Gemara says, V'asmechinu Rabbanan HaKorbanot. That the Rabbanan, the rabbis, based it, meaning the timing, on the times that korbanot were brought. So it really is a synthesis of both. So as far as a mechanical answer as to why we have three tefillot today, there were two answers, but really were one. Now, we do know, oh, sorry, jumped ahead, don't want to do that yet. I want to give you a little um, preview. I'm going to give a specific class. It may be the next one or the one after that. That's going to kind of be a part of this longer introduction that has to do with times of day we daven and terminology that gets thrown around all the time that many, many people do not know what it's talking about. I'll give you one common example. If you make early Shabbat, you look on your shul calendar, as we have here in our neighborhood, it says something called a plug menu. Okay, so you dive in Mincha at a certain time and you can dive in Marley after that and you can make Shabbat early. So what does that mean? What is plod? What, is, what does it mean? Chatzot hayom. What does it mean? The middle of the day. What does it mean? Mishe Yakir. There are all these different terminologies we use. I want you to be, again, those of you who've never had a class with me, uh, who've had a class with me, you've heard me say this too many times. But my purpose in teaching is not just to give you information. It's to make you more educated and to educate you in things that, unfortunately, many people either take for granted and say, I don't care if I know it or not, or never heard of that before. So I want to make you more educated. And in order to really get into tefillah, into sidur and all this, you also have to know this, this piece that I'm, I'm alluding to, which I may do already next week. Um, it has the beginning. I'll have about five minutes of math. I'm not a math guy, but it's actually very simple. And the rest will go through what's called a journey through the Jewish day. Now, we know that we use a sidur to dab. Okay, sidur could be this. <laughs> Nowadays, it could be just your, your phone. Uh, it could be a book. It could be from your head, which is not the greatest thing to do. I'll tell you why in a minute. But where does the word come from? This one should be fairly obvious, I would hope. Like we recently had a seder, right? And we had a seder on the night of Pesach. It means an order. And the 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 word sidur means it's been put in a specific order for you. Imagine for a moment you go to someone's house for a meal and they bring out, you sit down to the table, the, the, the smell, the aroma is fantastic. And they bring out dessert. You say, well, that's weird. I mean, other than my wife and a few other people I know, they don't usually consider the dessert the main course. So they bring out dessert. And after dessert, they bring out a salad. And after salad, they bench. And after benching, they bring out another salad. And then they bring out some chicken and then they bring out whatever. It's like, it's all in, out of weird order. Or you get invited to someone's house to have brunch and, uh, uh, sorry, breakfast. And they're serving you what normally be for meal for night. Or you come, there's no, there, something's wrong here. It's not in the right order. So it's, when we say tefillot, you might think that there's just an arbitrary listing that when the Chachamim wrote the Sidur, which we're going to come to, we'll go back to that slide uh, probably next week, but the arbitrary listing of where this come in, no, there's a very specific order when we go through Davin. I've read in more than one place, there's a Sidur written, uh, a commentary on Sidur written by a man named Rabbi Yaakov Emden. Some of you may know his name. In the 1700s was a source of very big machloket in Judaism, which is actually a historical, interesting uh, dispute. In any way, any case, on the top of every page in Hasidur, it kind of gives you a visual of where you're standing relative to the Kodesh Kodashim, the Holy of Holies in the Beit HaMikdash. If you picture yourself starting to be standing outside the Beit HaMikdash, 
and working your way inwards. And then finally, when you come to Shemona Esra, you're standing at the Kodesh Kodashim, standing at the Holy of Holies. That's why you start a journey. If I'm going to drive from my house in Malay Adumim to Eilat, I'm not going to go up to the Gilboa first and then go over to Haifa, then go to Tzfat, and then go head south. This is a very specific order I should be going into unless I'm looking for a fun time all over the place. So that's why it's called a Sidur, because it's in order. And also, another thing, the Gemara tells us in Rosh Hashanah, um, the quote, Amar Rabbi Eliezer Elazar le'olam yasdir adam tefilato v'achar kach yitpalel. True, the Shulchan Aruch tells us this refers to the Chagim, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, but it means that always a person should organize their tefilah and only then should you daven. And what does that mean? That in a time before we had Sidurim, that a person had to really sit down and review with someone who knew the davening in order to make sure they knew the order of what they were going to be saying. So interestingly enough, um, let's see if it's on this next slide. No, I don't want to do that. I'm just going to keep this up here for now. Uh, interestingly enough, um, when the Sidur, and again, I haven't told you where it comes from, why there are all different types of Sidurim, we'll get, we'll get to that. That's why I said that the introduction alone is going to take probably three or four classes. Um, that before there were actually printed Sidurim, and maybe they were just things that were handwritten, or even when there were some printed Sidurim, but they were rare, you didn't have a lot. What happened? People would line up. They have rows where people would have a Sidur. This is actually in the Kuzari also. People would stand here with a Sidur, and people behind them without a Sidur, they would look over the shoulder, and they would look and see the words and stand back and say them. They look over the shoulder and stand back and say them. And that's according to one opinion where the idea of shuckling during davening came from. Why do they shuckle? Why do they shake? Not because they were just, it could be because they wanted to get the get into it, but also historically, potentially, one of the reasons was that not everyone had a sidur. So they had to keep leaning over and looking at the person who had the sidur. Okay, here's what we're going to do. I have um, a lot still to talk about about the Sidur, the history of Sidur, who wrote the Sidur, where does it come from, the whole background on the day, the, the Jewish day. We talk about the, the Jewish life cycle, but this is just the Jewish day. So we have a, a lot of stuff to do still. Um, if you have any comments, any questions, any anything, send them to me, please, on WhatsApp directly. You can't post it in the group. I'll do that on purpose. And I'll, I'll address it Bezrat Hashem in, a, in a future class. Let me just see here. Um, uh, reroute the machine. Okay. Interesting. So when the comments was, when we, I said earlier, we changed ourselves with the with the tefillah, the concept maybe was to reroute the machine or the briat. Interesting. It's also like maybe you hear like recalculating on the old uh, on the old GPS systems. Interesting. Very good. Um, okay. Uh, for those of you who tuned in tonight expecting to meet, jump into Modeani and start already. Sorry to disappoint you. But I will leave you with one thought on Modeani, even though I'm not going to get to it probably for a couple of weeks. We wake up in the morning. We say, Modeani lefanecha melech chay de kayam, shechazarta bi nishmati bechem rabba emunatech. We thank Hashem for return. We admit, we admit, and we thank, that's the two meanings. Um, to Hashem, thank you for returning our soul. So two quick comments. Number one, why do we start our day off with bad grammar? Did you ever notice that? In Hebrew, you want to say, I write, ani kotev. I write. I walk. Ani holech. I think. Ani choshev. We don't say choshev ani. We don't say kotev ani. We say ani kotev. So why do I start off? Mode ani. It should start off our day. Adni mode. Because you cannot wake up in the morning. And the very first word out of your mouth is ani. Me. I. That's horrid. That'd be horrible to do. Because it's not about you. It's about Hashem. That's first of all. And so the first word out of our mouth in the day is mode. We're thanking Hashem. Toda. The second thing to mention to leave you with is we say, Rabba Emunatecha, your emuna, your faith is fantastic, is great. Whose faith? Am I talking to myself? Thanking Hashem and I'm saying, you know, your faith, I'm talking to myself now, is great and you're thanking Hashem. So most of the commentaries will tell you it's not about you, it's talking about Hashem. What do you mean Hashem has faith? Hashem has faith in you and in me. He's giving our neshama back to us to continue another day to do his work in this world. And it's Rabbi Munatecha that your faith in us, Hashem, is great. I want to thank you all for being here tonight for this inaugural class. 
Um, I am very much looking forward to many classes over the years, Bezrat Hashem. And as I say, if you have comments, questions, complaints, that's fine also, I take anything, send it to me directly on, on WhatsApp and we'll deal with it in future class. Have a wonderful evening. And uh, we have a few special days coming up now. Uh, we have Yom HaShoah, we have Yom HaZikaron and Yom HaTzmaut coming up. Um, so we'll deal with those Bezrat Hashem when we have that. One other, oh, one more final programming note. Next Sunday night, uh, I'd like to start maybe five minutes earlier. I'll put this in the group and maybe start stop a couple minutes earlier. We have an Azkara memorial service in our show um, for uh, uh, Shelly Frimmer, Zichon Ali Bracha, that for those people who want to be able to go to, I don't want to hold you up, but I'll, I'll put that into the, uh, into the group, Bezrat Hashem.